Senator Lyons introduced the vaping bill to us, but if she's not coming, we'll, we'll start with Jen Harvey first, and hopefully Senator Lyons will be here. Oh, Jen's here. How the heck are you, Jen? So, shall we go on the record? Yes. Attempt to make my way around. Yeah. Okay, so you want this kid to get. No, we can't just spend much time with Jen. It's always a trick. So, um, it's the first time we're hearing about it. We, you recall we had this bill in this committee, and Senator Lyons urged me uh, strongly, because she had already scheduled witnesses, to relieve ourselves of the bill. We have jurisdiction over tobacco regulation, and she assured me that we would get the bill back. Um, and uh, so, in, in assuming we will, I thought we'd start taking some testimony on this bill. Um, Jen, can you uh, can you, uh, as opposed to walking through the bill, can you give us? an overview of 60,000 foot view of what this bill attempts to do, what this state of the law is in the country and maybe even in some other states at this point? I will do my best. Jennifer Carvey, Legislative Council. Um, so we are looking at S-288, an act relating to banning flavored tobacco products and e-liquids. Um, as far as what the bill does, um, it has a number of findings in the first section about the about youth use of e-cigarettes and flavored e-cigarettes and regulation of menthol products. Um, so under the federal law, the FDA has um, for a number of years now banned all flavored cigarettes except menthol. Um, so, there are, so they allow menthol and they allow kind of traditional tobacco flavored cigarettes. Um, but no other flavors of cigarettes. Um, for e-cigarettes or vaping products, um, the FDA has just recently announced it will be, uh, actually I think the enforcement starts in May, but um, enforcing some free market approval authority that they have over flavored products, the, the sort of um, Upshot of that is a ban on uh, flavored cartridges and pods. Do you want me to? Yes. <laughs> we have a very important witness who will join us. Two chairs over here. Sorry, Cheryl. You can sit in line as well. Thank you. Thank you. And who is it? I'm waiting for my quorum to get quorum. Because I had something to be I, somewhere I, else. I know I share you with you. Oh, oh, we are so well listened. <laughs> uh, we were just starting out uh, expressing our interest in this bill as well as yours, and but we know very little, and just trying to get a lay of the land, both in Vermont, nationally, what the bill's major goal is. Uh, I've already, from what uh, Jen has said, I've already understood there's a difference between menthol and other flavors, and I'm curious as to why. But um, perhaps you can give us a 101 on this vaping situation. So I'll, I'll be very brief, because I think that uh, Jen will be able to walk through the bill um, with you. I, the overall goal is to reduce the sales of um, flavored cigarette, e-cigarette and tobacco products in the States who reduce the uh, accessibility of those products by kids. So we're trying to keep kids from becoming addicted to nicotine, and we have found that flavors are by far, uh, in fact, uh, the things that draw kids into um, nicotine addiction. And so there, there's the findings that you will see in the bill uh, will provide the basis for understanding how kids become addicted and the data that's available. We have some excellent resources in the state of Vermont um, on that, at, at the University of Vermont, Dr. Uh, Andrea Volante, uh, who testified in our committee. And we also have the Youth Risk a Behavior Survey that has recently been done, done by our Department of Health, uh, indicating that kids will migrate if all flavors except menthol are eliminated, uh, kids migrate to menthol, menthol. And 
And so our goal here is to um, eliminate all flavors, menthol being a, a mint flavor, and eliminating that as well, so it's not accessible to the kids. The federal government and, and Jen can, we're, we're putting together a table, a chart that indicates what the federal government does and does not do. But um, in 2009, the federal government banned flavors in many products, not all, uh, except for menthol. And so menthol has become the go-to, um, I would say, it, it, kids smoking flavors can is there any, together. Is, what distinguishes menthol from all other flavors? Um, well, I think it's something that the tobacco company has promoted over time. Uh, the marketing of menthol has been pretty direct to specific groups. And uh, because menthol, as you know, if you have a sore throat, you take a menthol lozenge, it makes your throat feel better. So uh, menthol lets the heat and the chemicals of the cigarette or the e-cigarette feel better. So that, I think, it's, it's really a, it doesn't help with the reducing addiction. There's no evidence of that. The um, FDA has not approved a cessation, because to my knowledge, they haven't approved any cessation product at all that contains menthol. And in fact, none of the e-cigarette or cigarette companies have applied to have any of their products considered as cessation products. So it just seems arbitrary to have that particular flavor um, identified and sorted out, uh, especially when we see the results of the Youth Risk Behavior Survey or the results of other studies indicating that uh, kids will migrate to menthol if other so, flavors are gone. So just a broad question. So we did several things last year to reduce your smoking, but because there are flavored products out there that are still an incentive for kids to skirt those laws, now is it flavors in cigarettes or flavors in vaping or flavors in both? Yes, in both. In both. Flavors generally, yes. Yes. So there and are flavored cigarettes out there right now? Menthol. And there, oh well, yeah, I think there's clove, I forgot what else. Okay. It's oh, it's just menthol. Just oh, menthol. Oh, that's right, clove has been dropped, so it's Sorry. So the federal government already bans flavored cigarettes? They ban flavors, but not in every product. Okay. So the, the, there's, there's some distinctions to be made. So if you're a kid, you can, or an adult, you can access a flavored single-use vape. Okay. And then you discard it. Okay, so the federal, federal government did not ban the single-use flavors. That's right. And what is the administration's position on this bill? The Department of Health, we've heard from the Department of Health, they're very positive. Okay, they're very positive, and they, um, I, uh, I didn't go so far as to ask the commissioner to say, do you support the bill? But he very much supports, uh, I think, the ban of all flavors. He indicated that in his testimony. And we will remember his testimony here in the last two years on um, Jewel and uh, mm -hmm. all the flavors there. He gave very strong mm -hmm. testimony about that. Okay. So, so the the issue there are, there are a number of frequently asked questions that we could go into, and I thought I will I, I will save those questions until we have a, a broader group of people to talk with, but. The things that we did, we have done, are good steps forward, uh, including going to 21, but they don't solve the whole problem. Because as long as you have these flavors out in the market and uh, available one way or another, they will attract use and will build um, addiction. The result will be that we'll have to put money into our healthcare system so the, you know, the first finding, I think, in the bill indicates how much it costs each of us each year to pay for uh, health care right. related to uh, vaping or tobacco, whether it's cardiovascular disease or whether it's lung disease. So um, the costs are 
astronomical. It's seven hundred and fifty nine dollars a person a year. It, it, Each pay out of our pockets. pockets. So can you uh, That's right. describe yeah, what you think happened on the federal level if there was a desire to ban flavored tobacco products? Was it a uh, well, why, why, dis why distinguish between single serve and a pack of, and what is a single serve I, of cigarette? I don't even know what that is. Um, electric, electronic cigarette, e-cigarette. So you buy a device and well, you Well, you buy the one device, it's a single smoke. And then you put cartridges in? Yeah, and then you, no, it's in, it's all, it, it's held. It's, there's a couple just, different things yeah, that explain yeah, here, and yeah. so I think it's really important for us to understand that there's, there are, there are, new, there are many different There devices. are lots of different ones. We have pictures of those, and maybe we should make sure that you get some of those. Uh, so there's various single use. I'm, I'm really just learning. So they're not yeah. all single use. That's what I want to say. They're not all single so use. Some here, of them are closed systems. So here, there are some that have a whole lot of uh, e-liquid in them. Right. And so you can use those today, tomorrow, and the next day until it runs out. Are, the, are those legal under federal law? Uh, yes. Yeah, they're they're legal, and so as long if but what we're trying to do is take the flavors out of those. Right, but are the flavors legal under federal law? You're trying e to know. Yes. Yes. What, so what, what 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 is illegal under the flavor law? All the flavors. Not so any liquids. I'm going to have to have Jen okay. sort this out for you. Okay. And because I'm, I'm not reporting the bill yet, but I'm going to tell you that we, and we do have a table that will help us understand that. Okay. And we, I, so the no, difference it's between, not as simple as it's it not as simple <laughs> as it sounds. No, it's more complicated than that. And so, but the, the biggest loophole in the bill, in the FDA rules, is having allowing for you to go and purchase a single e-cigarette, single-use e-cigarette with flavors, any flavor. That's a big loophole. So all flavors are banned in other areas. Some of the other. So people, I'll wait for Jed to give me more, but people actually go and buy one cigarette at a time. Well, I don't know how many they buy. Well, they buy. They smoke it one. Well, okay. They buy a box full of them. Okay. No, and the problem is that's the insidious other aspect yeah. is environmentally yeah. these are made of metal, and you don't know what the hell is. Yeah, there's made. another another bill we have in here to set up a recycling system right. for this cartridge. Exactly. Yeah. So they So may I ask a question? Absolutely. Um, Jen, Jenny, the, do I understand correctly that you are? saying that uh, addiction at the moment costs Vermont, Vermont taxpayers about $475 million? $348 million annually to treat tobacco-caused illness. Three forty eight, because it's seven fifty nine a person. It ends up being more like four hundred million. Well, it's including $87.2 million each year in Medicaid expenses. Yeah. What was that in Medicare? And productivity losses. A trait on the. It's in your fine, in our finding. The first one. So I, I think this is like one of the critical points of discussing this. We're not just talking about people's health. We're talking about the health to the budget as well. We're talking about two things that are avoidable and preventable. Okay. Addiction and burden on the budget. So what I'd like to do, Senator Clarkson, is. Uh, Jen has to leave at 10.30 as well, yep. so I'd like, I think maybe the most productive way I think for us to get grounded is for Jen to walk us through the findings and we'll ask questions as we go. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. And the, the findings may not explicate the things that you're asking me about right now, and that is what does the FDA ban, okay. what do they not ban, right. uh, in terms of the current product that's out on the market, because it goes from the loophole to... Okay, well that's what, that's what I actually want to get. And then, the, so. the, the, and then the, uh, the other piece you asked me is how did this happen? In this state alone, as I understand it, uh, we've had um, an influx of uh, $100,000, maybe $200,000 of pushback on this bill. Mm -hmm. So imagine what it's like at the federal level. Has any state done what we're trying to do? Massachusetts. 
Massachusetts has done this. And, and they've uh, included menthol as well? Yes, they have. Okay. And other states are considering it and probably looking at what we're doing. Okay, good. Thank you. So I'm sorry that touch. I am not more helpful at this time, but don't you worry. I'm not worried at all. <laughs> so, Mm -hmm. Cost is, it, they say the findings is per household, not per individual. So it's not seven hundred fifty. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, good. Thanks. Jen, can you join us for yes. 15 minutes? Fifteen minutes. Just try and ground us in sure. this issue. What's going on? What the bill tries to do? You know where things are at this point, as opposed to any kind of words in the in the bill, because your time is valuable to us, and we're just getting started. So I it's think just it would be helpful, picture. Mr. Chair, for us to hear. Does this bill mirror the Massachusetts bill? Are there differences? That would be useful. Um, and also, uh, recently, New Jersey also passed a labor ban. It had not, when I last looked, been signed by the governor, but I think it has been, uh, it's been signed, but I think it did pass in New Jersey. Um, so, okay, so under the current state of things, as you know, in Vermont last year, you raised the smoking age to 21. Um, and uh, there are a number of flavored vaping products, e-cigarette products, available. Um, you need to be 21 to purchase them legally in the state. Uh, at the federal level, the federal government is effectively banning, um, going forward, one of the three categories of um, what we call your e-liquid, sort of the, the, material, the substance liquid or gel that goes into the e-cigarette. So the three types are the pods or cartridges, um, like the jewel ones that a lot of people are familiar with. Those are the ones that the federal government is um, targeting. The other two types are the open tank, which is where people can fill um, a, a reusable um, device with liquids. Sometimes that means filling them at a vape shop or getting a bottle of liquid and, and putting it into um, the system, into the device. And then the third is disposable, one-time use um, e-cigarettes that already have the flavor included in it. Um, so the disposable ones and the open tank e-liquid ones, um, would st flavors would still be allowed in those at the federal level in, in less than until they take some action on those. So those are the ones that this bill, which bans the sale of any flavored e-liquid, um, e-cigarette, which we call tobacco substitute under the statutes, or tobacco product. Um, that's what this bill would affect. And so, uh, if I could, Mr. Chair, what is the legal age to buy tobacco in Massachusetts? Uh, I'm gonna consult with others, but I believe it's 21. I believe, right, so Massachusetts, a lot of their municipalities went to 21 before the state did. Um, and in just looking at the Massachusetts language, so no person, retailer, or manufacturer sell, shall distribute, uh, shall sell, distribute, cause to be sold, or distributed, offer for sale any flavor tobacco product or tobacco product flavor enhancer in any retail establishment online or through any other means to any consumer in the Commonwealth, except there's an exception for a smoking bar. Uh, of flavored tobacco products or tobacco product flavor enhancers for on-site consumption. So some sort of a smoke shot. The hookah, the hookah, yes, the hookah bar, hookah, the hookah okay. the hookah bar <laughs> and the village. I, images of it. Um, they do allow the sale of flavored tobacco products for nicotine, electronic nicotine delivery <coughs> systems, e-cigarettes, by online, phone, or other means. So that you just couldn't buy them in the store, but you could get them. Uh, online, it looks like, for Massachusetts. You can buy them online? That's what the language appears to say. Oh, so we're just driving more online? A person may make a sale of flavored tobacco products as it applies to electronic nicotine delivery systems by online, phone, or other means 
for delivery to a consumer located, oh, I'm sorry, to a consumer at Henry to the end located in another state. So the retailers can you sell. You can come in and listen if you'd like. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yes, are you guys here for opiates? Yes. Here, come on over. These are all our anti-smoking, anti-vaping youth activists. Thank you for letting us excuse me. Sure. No, what's the right from one in um, Richmond? Richmond. There. And, and does it include the closed containers? The Massachusetts? Yes. Massachusetts. So we have to look at their. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> We have to look at their definition of flavored tobacco product. Uh, I was asking about the closed system. Right. The closed system? Yes. The, so the ones you can buy in bulk or the, no, no, no. the ones you can purchase as a closed tent? No, these are the ones that you uh, get uh, a reusable. Yeah. Um, Device that you fill with the liquids. Right, and you could buy that. The open if one tank. of the problems the is tank. about purchase in a in a closed system. You can refill them from any. No, bottle. no, I understand. Yeah. Um, so I think so. Um, before we go too deeply into the Massachusetts one, I, I think it's important that you understand what is in the bill mm -hmm. in front of you, especially yeah. as um, potentially amended the draft we're going to be looking at in the Senate Health and Welfare Committee in a few minutes. Um, so one of the changes that this bill would make to the existing law and going forward um, as well would be to eliminate the um, penalty for possession of tobacco products by minors. So currently there is a $25 um, penalty for a minor in, who is um, possessing a uh, tobacco product, tobacco substitute. Um, or tobacco paraphernalia, this bill would eliminate that penalty for possession and actually uh, um, eliminate the prohibition on possession. It would just apply the ban to minors purchasing or attempting to purchase what, those products. What page? Nine. Could you, that's important. Can you explain the rationale of them to that decision? That was a request from um, the tobacco advocates, so I would let them speak to you about their reasons, but that was language that the committee discussed on Friday wanting to see in the next draft, and so okay. I we, we discussed that last year, as I recall. That was under a big discussion last year. Right, it, it has been an ongoing discussion. I mean, I think that the short version of the argument is uh, not to penalize addiction. Here. So people have become addicted to nicotine and are continuing to use it. Um, there is concern from some about a penalty for that. Um, the other piece that I want to bring to your attention, especially in light of um, reading to you some of the Massachusetts language, the bill, the prior version of the bill that was in the Health and Welfare Committee was a ban on the um, selling, offering for sale, giving, providing, transporting, manufacturing, or otherwise distributing flavored tobacco products, flavored e-liquids, or flavored tobacco substitutes. I'm on page 17 and the yeah, language is crossed what? out. Yeah. What this bill would do instead is uh, limit and this was, again, a decision from the committee on Friday, limit just to a prohibition on the retail sale. No person shall engage in the retail sale of any flavored tobacco product, flavored e-liquid, or flavored tobacco substitute. Um, and there was discussion in the committee on Friday about uh, people being able, in particular, to bring menthol cigarettes purchased in another state back to friends or family in Vermont and an interest in maintaining that opportunity. So they have now limited it to retail sale, um, but not a prohibition on um, giving, providing, transporting, manufacturing, or distributing. So the supply chain could be from out of state as gifts? Uh, as gifts or other, or gifts or sale. It's the retail sale that would be prohibited. So you couldn't go into a store and buy Flavored, uh, but you could products. buy it from the from the you could buy trunk it from of a car if there was a whole right. setup um, operation. Yeah, potentially. I There's a whole black market. Right. There are there so are that. certainly enforcement provisions um, that that may come into play, but our existing statutes but prohibit the retail sale of 
products without a tobacco license. Um, and so this would be consistent with um, keeping it in the vein of retail sale. Right, but seems to be promoting a black market sale. I mean, really, that's what it, that, that it enables right there. Well, John, John is our attorney, attorney. and she is not to weigh in on policy. Right, right. Or characterization. Um, so those are the main things. So in, in that I wanted to focus you on as far as kind of what the moving pieces are at the moment. So the bill does give a number of findings. There are findings about youth use of e-cigarettes um, and flavored e-cigarettes and um, the potential impact of regulating menthol cigarettes, which are still allowed under federal law. Um, the, um, yeah, and then I made a number of conforming changes throughout both 7 BSA Chapter 40 and some other statutes. There is also language, um, this will be familiar to the chair, at the end of the bill that would direct the Attorney General's office to report on whether and to what extent Vermont could legally restrict advertising and regulate the labels for e-cigarettes and other vaping related products. What? Uh, that's section eight? That's section eight. So just in terms of uh, the disposable versus the open tanks, has there been any testimony as to what's more prevalent in terms of sales in the state of Vermont? So my understanding is that currently the, the most popular form is the pods, the cartridges and pods that will be um, yeah. banned by enforcement action at the federal level. Right. Um, but uh, I have, I mean, I've read news articles suggesting that people are starting, that children or youth are starting to turn to um, the disposable single use ones that are still allowed. And I don't know about the, um, the use of the open tank. Uh, I know that's happening. But I don't know the so, numbers. can you describe it? I mean, maybe we need to show and tell it. What is a dis what is a disposable vaping product or cigarette look like? This is where I would love to have the advocates <coughs> give me more information because okay, okay, I'm not personally right, familiar. So, okay, then the last question I had, I guess, before we have to leave, is where is, <coughs> as you can tell at this point the committee on the menthol issue? Uh, I think they are split. I don't think there is full consensus on the menthol issue. I think there are, and, there, some members are, and, want, want to actively want to include it, some have concerns about including it in the van. So I'm trying to understand the difference why menthol is singled out. Is that because the historical fact that there's been menthol cigarettes forever in this country, or? I, I, I think it was a bit of a compromise at the federal level to retain menthol. They have been popular. Um, testimony that the that the Health and Welfare Committee heard and that the that the uh, chair of Health and Welfare was alluding to is that menthol has a, a, a numbing effect. It suppresses the cough reflex, and so um, it makes it more comfortable to historically to to smoke these or use these products. Um, has it been, I guess just to try historically, smoking for adults, cigarettes, they have up until recently been allowed to be flavored, and this new federal prohibition is on all flavors except for menthol for cigarettes? No, for, for cigarettes, this has been in place since 2009, uh, the ban on flavored cigarettes. E-cigarettes weren't really a thing then, or, or not big anyway, so uh, I don't know that they that they reached federal attention and the federal government hadn't um, given itself deeming authority over um, e-cigarettes in order to regulate them at that point. So, uh, so menthol has been excluded from the ban on cigarettes at the federal level, uh, flavored cigarettes at the federal level, for a little over 10 years, is my understanding. Um, this new regulation on flavored e-cigarettes um, is uh, would prohibit all flavors except tobacco and menthol okay. for the pods only. So you've still got all flavors available in the other two types, um, and it's tobacco and menthol that would be allowed, right, like anybody who's wrong? 
consulting. <laughs> I hear whispering. That's your friend didn't help in that chat. I know. <laughs> you got the deer in the headlights. So. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so the 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 federal government is um, focusing on mint and fruit flavors and other flavors like that, but not on uh, menthol and tobacco flavor. And the, the, the just one last question: the disposables. They're like a cigarette, but they're, they have liquid in them as opposed to tobacco? So I don't know if you can say they're, I mean, they're, they're uh, my understanding is that they tend to look more similar to a traditional cigarette size-wise. Right. Um, and, and you shake. know those old Hollywood movies where the woman walks in and she has the long thing? Right, that's it? It's pretty much like Right, that. so it's got the liquid in it. Yep. Um, but the way these work is instead of burning tobacco like you do with a combustible cigarette, a traditional right. cigarette. It heats, it uses a, a battery or other electronic Bucket mechanism yeah. to um, to heat the liquid or gel, right. turn it into an, a vapor or aerosol that the person kind of breathes, you know, inhales into their lungs or otherwise absorbs into their the tissues in their mouth. And John has nicotine. Generally has nicotine, does not always have nicotine. The bill um, does not is not specific to those products that contain nicotine. So the e definition of e-liquid is, is with or without nicotine. So it's more after the flavor than the nicotine in terms of... I think it depends on the person. Okay. I mean, nicotine is addictive, so once somebody has begun to use nicotine, that may also be a drug. Okay. Well, that's a good start. Thank right. you. We'll probably have yes. you back. Okay. And hopefully the Thank advocates you. could give us, round out a bunch of this just to... What's going on here? We're right. Just getting our feet wet. It's a huge additional waste issue. So I have the order here. And um, is Andy McLean here? Yes. Is somebody in the from, hall on the way some, in. Someone here from MMR? No? Um, I am, I think. Matt? Tonight, Matt McMahon, MMR. I think that Andrew had communicated with uh, with yes. your that person that he'd be available uh, later this morning when he's tied up right now. Okay. Oh, I didn't, I didn't get that. I'm sorry. I, I was, okay. Okay. He told me in the hall he was expecting yeah, to testify yes. here this morning. Well, I thought it's, so. it's fine because I think it makes more sense yeah. here for the proponents first. So, uh, Jennifer. Good morning. <laughs> I think my testimony may clear up some of the, the questions that you all had. So Jennifer Costa, Government Relations Director for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. Um, so I have a PowerPoint, um, but since you're a paper committee, I have copies for everyone. We're, we are economic development. Paper, I would remind us, is a good Vermont product. I, I'm fine with paper. <laughs> Uh, we need one for As Cheryl and we need one for Denise. Thank you. So I think that's Denise. And this is Cheryl. Yep. Yeah. Oh, Denise. <coughs> so we're here to talk about ending the sale of flavored tobacco. The American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network supports ending the sale of all flavored products with no exemption. So what does that mean? That's all flavors, so including mint and menthol and all products, e-cigarettes regardless of their nicotine content, menthol cigarettes, and other tobacco products. Just something to stop yeah. you So you're, I mean, that's a big statement to get rid of menthol cigarettes for, I mean, I remember my mother smoking Newports 50 years ago, so whatever. You're, that's what you're talking about, getting rid of menthol cigarettes as well, okay? I'll, I'll get there, Okay. Um, and other tobacco products, so your, your, your dip, or chew, snuff, um, did. Why now? I think that was a question that, that came up. Um, flavored tobacco is erasing years of gains Vermont has made in tobacco cessation and prevention. I'll talk more about that as we look at the 2019 results of the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which are quite concerning. I think it's important to remember that smoking remains the number one cause of preventable death in Vermont. This year in the state, we'll lose 1,000 Vermonters to smoking. And if smoking continues at the current rate, 10,000 Vermont kids alive today will die prematurely from smoking-related illnesses. Um, as the senator mentioned, smoking is expensive. 
costing Vermont taxpayers hundreds, <coughs> state and taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars every year. And most importantly, flavors hook kids. If you will indulge me for one minute, I'd like to share a video from Counterbounds. Um, I think I have the sound on my computer. This is the um, health department, part of the health department youth campaign. Which health department? Ours? Ours, yes. Just one minute long. And that's why I'm against the dog leash resolution. Uh, next we have uh, Kaylee. I'm Kaylee. Hello, Vermont decision makers. I'm here with my friends in the Counterbalance campaign to tell you how flavored tobacco products can hurt kids like us. We like orange, strawberry, and other fun flavors. And the tobacco companies know this. So while we can't buy these yummy flavors in cigarettes, they're still available in cigars, cigarillos, e cigs dip, and chew. And two out of three kids say they use these products because they come in flavors they like. So are you going to take action against flavored tobacco or just let more kids like us turn into lifelong tobacco users? Vermont's kids need your help to speak up and fight for their health. Come to a community event and talk with your key decision makers about the dangers of flavored tobacco products. Visit counterbalancept.com to learn more. And that's what these kids are doing here today, right? So I kind of wanted to share that with you. One, to give you a sense of where the health department is at, and two, um, just to show that this is an issue that is about youth prevention and youth in our state, obviously by the, the um, folks in the room today, the young people in the room, that matters to them. Um, so this is what we started to talk about with Senator Lyons, tobacco's price tag. It's enormous. Smoking costs Vermont $348 million every year in medical expenses. Vermont's Medicaid costs caused by smoking are nearly $88 million. Smoking caused productivity losses in Vermont are $233 million, roughly. Um, and then the, the clarification of, of the point the senator made is Vermont taxpayers' state and federal tax burden from smoking caused government expenditures is $759 per Vermont household. And then I think it's also important to talk about um, this, this bill is important to big tobacco too, and they spend almost $17 million a year pushing their products in Vermont. As public health organizations, why this is a critical bill to us is that we know that flavors hook kids. Flavors are nothing more than a marketing weapon used by the tobacco industry to lure kids into a lifetime of addiction. Tobacco flavors like cherry, grape, cotton candy, gummy bear, they're clearly not aimed at the established adult tobacco user. Years of tobacco industry's own documents confer that the intended use of flavors is to target children. Altering tobacco products, ingredients, and design, like adding flavors, can increase a product's appeal um, by masking the harsh effects of tobacco, making the nicotine inhalation easier. And I'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to menthol. So it's no surprise that you say that flavors are the leading reason they use tobacco products and they perceive tobacco products as less harmful as a result of these kid enticing fun flavors. And the next page, um, flavors are also a, a big business. There are, they flooded the market. There's, as we talked about, there's some cute confusion around the different types, but there's lots of different brands, lots of different vehicles, if you will, for this. Um, but in terms of flavors, there's currently more than 15,500 distinct flavors of tobacco <coughs> available to consumers. That those unique flavors have doubled in five years. I didn't even know that there are 15,500 flavors, period, let alone of, of tobacco. So I was surprised that last time I testified, the flavors were 7,700. That was what we had um, available to us for a number. And now, um, since 2014, that has doubled to 15,000. I want to give you a sense of some of these flavors, and, and you can make your own judgment <laughs> about who they're appealing to. Some of the more popular flavors, gummy bear, mango, birthday cake, s'mores, creme brulee, cotton candy, unicorn puke. That's really attractive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> unicorn vomit is another popular yes. one. Very berry slushy, apple pie, strawberry shortcake, Skittles, and buttered popcorn. <coughs> 
So if I could, so Mr. Chair, this is what I was talking about. And yes. I do have pictures of all the products that I we're like talking the about. dots. I used to eat those dots. I love those right dots. Right the I dots. was just thinking, <laughs> we need a Levensies. But it looks like a cigarette holder. Like a. And on the next slide. So consequently, this is the gummy bear slide. More than 80% of teens who have ever used tobacco started with a flavored product. More than 80%. Um, and then if you look at current use, so that was ever use. If you look at current use, the, that number is from the CDC on the left-hand side of your page. Seven out of 10 middle school and high school students who currently use tobacco use a flavored product. The numbers are. Did the CDC do a breakout for people? Um, I'm not sure if they, of those same group of kids, yeah. if they did. Um, I do have statistics specifically related to menthol later. Um, and the next slide, so let's talk about Ver Vermont's impact. Um, the youth tobacco use rates are rising. More than one in four kids now use some form of tobacco. Last time we talked to you, it was a little less than one in four, and now we're um, up to 28% for Vermont kids using some form of tobacco. I want to dive specifically into the Vermont Risk Behavior Survey, Youth Risk Behavior Survey. So as you all know, it's completed by high school students in Vermont every two years. And so as we've testified in your committees over the last couple of years, we've had old data. We had a sense that the data was going to be outdated and our fears, unfortunately, were confirmed. So the first slide is ever tried any flavored tobacco product. You'll see in 2017, that number was 21%. In 2019, so this, this data was released um, in January of this year, we're up to 27%. So in high school, you're seeing six, a 6% 6 rise. In the public health world, a 6% <coughs> rise is incredibly significant in a two-year period. If you look at the uh, before the age of 13, in 2017, we had 10% of kids younger than 13 had tried a flavor product. Now we're up 5% to 15% of under 13-year-olds have tried a flavored product. And I do just want to call, this is not in the slides, but just looking closer at the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, we are, of course, concerned about any substances that kids are using underage. But this is on page 45 of the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, tobacco, tobacco, alcohol, marijuana use before age 13. If you look at all of the substances, alcohol, marijuana, cigarettes, and flavored tobacco, this is substance use before the age of 18. Flavored tobacco is by far the highest. And although it's close to alcohol, you'll see that over 10 year periods, the other substances are all seeing decreases while flavored tobacco in our youngest children is seeing a market increase. So it's just, just something that I wanted to point out. The next slide talks about ever tried um, an electronic vapor product. That's the e-cigarette, fancy word for e-cigarette. So in 2017, we had 34% of high school students have tried an e-cigarette. Now we have 50%. So one out of every two of our high school students have tried an e-cigarette. That's a 16% increase in just two years. At the bottom, you can see this is the breakout um, by year. So right now, we're at one and two. But back in 2015, it was 30%. So we had 30%, 34%, and now we're up to 50%. So we see the steady increase. Between male and female, it's pretty much the same. Um, and then you'll see the, the grading. That's ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. You'll see that similar curve as we go along. What's that next one? Definitely. The next one is white, non-Hispanic, and the other one is students of color. And then um, heterosexual and LGBTQ. And you'll notice for um, some of these slides that students of color and those who identify as LGBTQ have significantly higher rates of tobacco use. Going to the next slide, this one's current e-cigarette use, and I think this one is critical um, because these are kids who are, are actively using, not have I ever tried it, but are actively using an e-cigarette. In 2017, we had 12% of kids now our reality is 26%. So we have more than doubled our e-cigarette usage in two years. That's astounding. Um, and if you, again, look at the breakout by 
year in 2015, we had 15%, and then we we went down. We did better. We're at 12%. <coughs> then Juul came on the market in 2017, and we're skyrocketed to 26%. You'll also notice um, by grade level, 34% of our high school seniors are now currently using e-cigarettes. On to the next slide. This is, I think, one of the more disturbing slides. This is the frequency of vaping use. So in 2017, of the kids who were using an e-cigarette, 37% were using it just one to two days a month. If you look at 2019, now we have, we have the complete opposite happening. We have 31% of those kids using their e-cigarette every day. I think it, it is testimony to the addictive power of these products. And so if you look at 20, 20 and more days, <coughs> you are up to 40, let me do my math here, 43% in 2019 use their, their um, e-cigarettes 20 and more days a month. And if you look again at high school seniors, we're almost at 50% who vape are using it 20 or more days a month. The next slide. Um, this is current tobacco product use. So this takes into account cigarettes, cigars, smokeless tobacco, e-cigarettes. In 2017, we had 19%, so slightly less than that one in four. Now we're at 28%. So we've seen almost a 10% increase in kids using some form of tobacco. So we are going the wrong direction in terms of public health and youth prevention. And if you look specifically at high school seniors, that number jumps even higher to 37% of high school seniors in Vermont now use some form of tobacco. Uh, Jennifer, can you give us a notion of the cost of, 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 jewel, of a jewel, you know, not a one-time. Well, we'd love to know the one-time too. But what's the cost to the student? Um, I actually do. Tina, do you know what the current cost of the jewel is? I know before it was um, before our e-cigarette tax, which was great because we know a way to reduce youth initiation is to raise the price. But it was four dollars and fifty cents for one pod, and I, I believe they come in four packs. So. Um, but now the tax essentially doubled the price. And then that doesn't include the actual device. You buy the device, the battery part, one time, and then the pods plug in like a USB, um, and you buy those. Some of you might know. Do any of you know the cost of a jewel? Um, I know that there's like starter kits that are like 50 bucks that come with pods and non-nicotine pods. Tina just handed me this, it says $20, but I don't know if that's in Vermont. So the starter kit, you, well, you think it's 50? Yeah. Oh, 50 total. 50 total, okay. So the jewel device is 20. The jewel device is 20 and the pods now are 30. That's a lot of money for it is a, a kid, unless they have a robust part-time job, or parents that give them very healthy allowance anecdotally what we hear from kids too is that somebody has it and it becomes a social thing in school and whoever has the jewel they meet and they all use it so it's the sharing of a device and that's a public health challenge right there <laughs> um, moving on to the next slide this is current cigarette use this is where we do have a glimmer of hope in Vermont um, in terms of tobacco use Cigarette use is the one place that we saw a slight decrease, which is great. In 2017, high school use of, use of cigarettes, excuse me, was 9%. Now in 2019, we're at 7%. So we did see a decrease. And this is why it is critically important to us, and I'm gonna to move to this in a minute, that menthol is included. We do not want to see that progress get erased too. And our fear is if you take every other flavor off the market but leave menthol cigarettes, that we will now have kids move to menthol cigarettes and in two years, the public health advocates will be back talking to you about, remember that 7% number? Well, we left menthol and now that has skyrocketed and we've erased our cigarette So progress. in terms of the <coughs> slide on current tobacco product use, 
28 percent of high school. Uh, when you said 2019, what's what's the date of this survey? I mean, is that for all of 2019 or? This the survey was given to high school students in 2019. <coughs> what, what part of 2019? In the fall, I think. I believe it's February, March, February, March. And then it's calculated and released like in January of the following Fun. year. So we just got the There's results. That. And we won't have new results. For two more years? Yeah. So except except for I will talk, um, Senator Lyons mentioned um, Dr. Andrew Polanti, and at, she's at the UVM uh, Medical School, and or UVM, and she is doing the PACE study, which will give us incrementally three-month data. So it's not as large of a sample as all of Vermont high school kids, um, but it's it's... So do you, at least incrementally. Do you expect this 28% to go down in the next report? Well, I think it depends on what we do here in Vermont. Well, last year you came in and told us do all these things and we did them. You're yep. saying you're not going to see any reduction as a result of that? Um, I will get to that. I think that's a very valid point. And that's something, actually, I can talk about it now. I think that let's wait and see is a message that the tobacco industry pushes because as we wait and see, kids keep using and kids keep addi getting addicted. Two years ago, as the legislature started talking about T21, look what happened in two years that we debated this issue and, and thought it through, rightfully so, but at, at the same time, the use rate doubled. Um, and so what I think is we did a fantastic job addressing the um, availability so, and the accessibility. The accessibility by like the age, the availability by the internet bill and the price. What we didn't do is address the enticeability, the demand, why do kids want to try to get these products, why, why do they want the products? They want the products because they have these cool, fun, enticing flavors. So our feeling is if you add this component of flavors, it will kind of close the circle and make those three laws that we passed last year work even better. So we've done some work, we've done great work to address accessibility and availability, but now we have to remove the incentive for kids to try to get these things in violation of our laws. Let me just ask though, what, what's the historical data regarding the use of menthol products before vaping even came on the scene? What percentage uh, of menthol products were being consumed by youth as opposed to? Okay, I can jump ahead to that um, just so you have a visual. Uh, and we talked about, let me just, no, I will promise I'll get back to that in just one second. Um, this is what's happening around the country, Massachusetts. I think it's the next one. So this goes into all Sorry, of Before you even get there, just, you have two current tobacco use slides. You have one that was a point in time current use last winter, which is the slide uh, before the next one, which it says current tobacco use, where it actually goes down, where we have the graph. That's cigarette use. Oh, that's just cigarettes. Yes, that's why I was saying menthol. That's why I was harping on menthol. Got it, that got page. it, got it, got it. So this is all tobacco. Yeah, products. current tobacco use, it says in there, includes cigarettes, cigars, smoke with tobacco, it. and yep, yep. cigarettes. Got it. Um, so the, the highlight of Massachusetts, like top line, 60,000 foot view, is that it bans the sale of all flavored tobacco products, including e cigarettes, menthol cigarettes, cigar, pipe, and other loose tobacco. Uh, those other bullet points go into some of the other things the bill does. Um, it was a very robust bill. Um, if I don't need to take the committee's time to walk through that bill because it's doing some of the things that we're not in terms of. Um, well, I, I can just let you read that. Earmarking revenue collected, increasing right. penalties. Um, but, but moving on to menthol. Yep. So menthol, I say, is like the OG. It was the original flavor. Long before cigarette companies started adding fruit, candy, and alcohol flavorings to cigarettes, they were manipulating levels of menthol to addict new young smokers. And do we know the date menthol was introduced? I believe it was, I don't know, the 30s? A long time. A long time. Yeah, no, no, I, I, but it's been in the mainstream of tobacco use for 
decades. Yeah. Yeah. So in 2009, the Tobacco Control Act outlawed flavored cigarettes but exempted menthol. And Senator Strzokin, you asked this question. That was in large part due. Why, why did they leave menthol on the market? That was um, in large part due to very strong tobacco industry lobbying. They were able to keep menthol. Um, and this is troubling because menthol makes cigarettes easier to smoke and harder to quit. And I think I can give you a visual, think a cough drop, how your throat feels when you suck on a menthol cough drop. It's that, that sensation of, of a cooling. So menthol acts to mask the taste of tobacco with a minty flavor, it creates a cooling sensation in the throat, reduces the harshness of cigarette smoke, and suppresses coughing. Um, I do have this, this is from the CDC, and I just want to read uh, one, one highlight. Tobacco companies add menthol to their cigarettes to make them seem less harsh and more appealing to new smokers and young people. Menthol in cigarettes likely leads people, especially young people, to experiment with smoking. It could also increase a young person's risk of becoming dependent on nicotine. Compared to adults who smoke non-menthol cigarettes, adults who smoke menthol cigarettes make more attempts to quit and have a harder time quitting. And so I just included the drug facts of a cough drop because it, it shows that it's a cough suppressant and an oral analgesic, um, anesthetic. So it, it numbs the throat. In terms of the next slide, um, our position is that Big Tobacco has shamelessly targeted communities of color for decades um, and young people. Knowing that youth who experience less negative uh, physiological effects of smoking are more likely to continue smoking regularly, the tobacco industry has spent decades manipulating its menthol brand specific cigarettes to appeal to youth and in particular African Americans. Black adults who smoke have the highest percentage of menthol cigarette use of any racial and ethnic group. So if you look at the chart on the side, um, this was between 20, uh, 2008 to 2010 and then 2012 to 2014, arguably both before the, the boom of e-cigarettes. And so you can see here that um, black smokers have nearly doubled the rates and, and almost triple the rates of any other racial or ethnic group. Other, other high-risk groups include women, those who identify as LGBTQ, people with lower economic educational levels, and those with mental health issues. And the next slide goes directly to your question, Senator Brock. Um, more than half of youth ages 12 to 17 who smoke use menthol cigarettes. That's 54% specifically. And again, that number was taken uh, 2012 to 2014. So before the boom of Juul, which came on the market in 2017. And you can see that 12 to 17 year olds are by far the age that is the largest consumer of menthol cigarettes. 50 plus is 33%, and it goes up from there, with the second group being 18 to 25 at 50%. Um, That's a percentage of current smokers. Of current smokers. And Again, what my question was really aimed at the larger population as a whole as to how, you know, has there been any change over time pre jewel in consumption of menthol cigarettes by youth? In other words, how many, what percentage of youth smoke menthol cigarettes as opposed to smoke in general? And has that, was that, did that change over time? Well, I think it's 54% of youth who of smoke users. smoke menthol cigarettes of youth who smoke, smoke menthol cigarettes. And, and for... Does that answer your question? And for African-American youth, it's higher, 7 out of 10. Uh, Senator Brock, are you trying to distinguish between smoking tobacco cigarettes and vaping? Yes. So I, well, I, was trying, yeah, I was trying actually to just so, distinguish what percentage of kids smoke, what percentage of kids smoke menthol. So we know right now, Vermont, the percentage of kids who smoke is 7%. Mm -hmm. So... Of, of that, um, in Vermont specifically, we can look further down. But that's obviously changed over time too, because that's going down, right? Well, this is the PACE study. So this was Dr. Andrew Volante's study just mm -hmm. done in 2019. Um, this is among Vermonters age 12 to 25. 
27% of those who smoke use menthol or mint cigarettes. 56% of those who use e-cigarettes use menthol or mint. These are Vermonters. Mm -hmm. But over time, I just have that 2019 data, the most recent data. So, um, but to your point also, in terms of the, the um, discrepancies for black youth who smoke, it, that number rises to seven out of 10. What, what is the reason of that last figure, which 27, 56%, what do you attribute the doubling of menthol and mint cigarette, uh, menthol and mint use? in an e-cigarette versus a cigarette? Um, I think more kids smoke e-cigarettes than smoke cigarettes. But then also the next slide will show you Juul, most kids smoke Juul, or vape Juul. And no, but that doesn't answer the question. It says among youth 12 to 25, mm -hmm. those who use cigarettes, only 27% use methyl or mint. But those who use e-cigarettes, 56 percent use menthol or mint. Why is there a doubling in the usage of menthol or mint in a in e vaping product versus a cigarette? I think because two things. One, I think more kids are using e-cigarettes, and Juul voluntarily pulled its flavors from the market, but left mint and menthol. So you could get flavors in Juul online, but then Vermont passed the law last year. But you could still go into a brick and mortar store and get mint and menthol Juul. So I think that's why in Vermont, it's availability. A kid can go into a store, and I can't get mango in the store anymore, but I can get mint and menthol still. But you could also get mint and menthol in a cigarette still. But I think that goes to the more kids use e-cigarettes. E-cigarettes are definitely more popular than cigarettes. They're um, easier to hide, but you can't buy them anymore. A, a kid can't buy them anymore. Yeah. Well, they never could before. You could buy them 18 if you were 18, saying, but that's still a kid. Key. But 21 and above, I mean, they, they aren't actually able to go in and buy anything right now. Correct. But yet, they're still getting them somehow. Yeah, I'd love to know that supply line. You know, we have uh, three kids in the room. I mean, we just... Maybe we uh, pull the chair, just pull the three of you and find out how are kids getting them and how are they affording these products? Um, I know that just identify yourself for the record. Oh, I'm Ian from Richford. Um, I know that a lot of the kids in our school either get them from their parents or they have other friends who have people who can get them from the stores or they have other other friends. It's just it's a lot. You had something to say. Um, I know mostly. What, what's your name? Oh, sorry. My name is Lacey from Richburg. I know kids mostly get them from their parents or an adult that is old enough to buy tobacco products. But are they stealing them from adults? I mean, you know, adults know that it's illegal for kids to have them. Some adults might just buy them and give them to their child just because. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> we had a kid on our field trip who brought a jewel because their mom bought that for them for the field trip. And the mom gave it to the child. But while knowing that, they're not supposed to have it. And how are they affording this? I mean, when you say it's 50 bucks to, to get a starter kit, how are kids affording this? Some kids can get the jewels from the parents for free, sell them for money. Or they have uh, part-time jobs that get enough money to buy them. Thanks. Um, the next slide. Parents. <laughs> really? Should be licensing parents. Senator Brock, this may answer your question too. This is what I was talking about in terms of, of Juul. Um, so mint and menthol makes up the largest majority of Juul sales with estimates as high as 80%. The evidence indicates that if any e-cigarette flavors are left on the market, kids will switch from one to the other. How do we know that? Well, in November of 2018, Juul removed um, its other flavors. I think mango was the most popular at one point. Um, from stores, in response, mango was easily replaced with mint and menthol. At the same time, 2018, youth use of fruit and flavors fell, while youth use of mint and menthol increased by 50%. 
So you can see that Minton menthol went from 51% up to almost 64%, while uh, fruit went from 75 down to 65. <coughs> Uh, the FDA warns that menthol harms public health but has failed to take action since 2009. The FDA has commissioned two separate reports which conclude that the removal of menthol cigarettes from the marketplace would benefit public health and save thousands of lives. Almost one-third of those lives would be black lives. Um, another study looked at if menthol cigarettes were removed from the market, 39% of all menthol smokers, 45% of black menthol smokers, and nearly 65% of young menthol smokers report they would try to quit. Yet the FDA has failed to take action on menthol, which is why we are appealing to states to take action. So I wanted to go through briefly what the FDA guidance released in January 2020 does. So what it, what it removed from the market? It removed flavored closed pod systems. What does that mean? The best example is Juul. But it left Jewel version of menthol on the market. So it, it, it gets rid of the mango and the cucumber and the mint, but it leaves menthol. What can stay on the market? All menthol products, including flavored e-cigarette menthol. Um, and then flavored tobacco e-liquids in refillable tank-based systems. So those are cotton mods. That's what you see at the bottom, the black one. You put the e-liquid in there. All of those 15,000 flavors can stay on the market. And then disposable products, which is the biggest loophole right now. Um, and I did want to pass this out for reading, <coughs> your reading pleasure. This is a recent New York Times article in January, uh, January 30th. And this talks about, there is one for Denise as well. Um, this is, how teens have already figured out. They're, they're 10 steps ahead of us. So we're still talking about Juul and trying to address Juul because Juul is what most kids use. Well, in light of the FDA ban that targets Juul, kids have moved to disposable. So now Juul sold last year, and the thing that kids are using now are called puff bars. And these are the disposals. They look just like Juul. So it's a closed pod system, but it, there's no pod. You just use it once, and you throw it out. But those, because of the, what the FDA's rules say, all the flavors can stay on there. So kids have just, so there's just one quote that I think that's pretty telling. It's, it's a teacher that they interviewed for this article and says, we're still back on Juul. Ms. Rogers continued describing school administrators' approach to um, policing teen vaping. She says her students tell her, Juul, so yesterday we've moved on. She concluded teens are very savvy, and if they're addicted, they're going to continue uh, they're going to do what it takes to continue the habit that is now plaguing their lives. So the, the article goes on um, to talk about how the, the FDA action doesn't really do much to address the youth vaping epidemic and flavors in general. May, then, may, 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 may I just, with the indulgence of the chair, just ask the, our students, because I know you have room 11 at 11, um, how do you notice the behavior of your friends who have gotten hooked? Because clearly you guys must have friends who use this a lot. What do you notice is the behavior difference? Um, <clears throat> we're always talking about it. And they're always, like, very needy for it. Are they more agitated? Because we had heard in testimony last year that they were much, they got angry quicker, they were, they were more agitated, they were, you guys notice any of that? And like, if they don't have a headphone, you can kind of notice that they feel a little sick, hmm. like withdrawal sick. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so the next couple of slides are just visual pictures because I know we were trying to talk and describe about these. So these are devices sold with empty refillable pods that are exempt. After Juul, Sworn, and Smoke were the most popular e-cigarette devices. And then the next one, disposable products that are exempt. So that's the Puff Bar, the Mango Mojo. So which one of these is the Puff Bar? Next page. Oh, not any of these? Well, because those, those are um, refillable. Okay. So refillable pods 
are still able to be on the market. And so then you just, have a refillable pod. Can you smoke that for a long, longer period of time than a yeah. disposable puff yes. bar? Yeah. You can get like multiple cigarettes or yeah. cigarettes out of those. You get the yeah. You just refill it when the e-liquid runs out. You fill it back up. The co-op has not got it in the bulk section yet. <laughs> okay. Or won't, really. But that's sort of what you could buy, is you can buy a bulk tank and keep refilling it. And then the next page is, those are the disposable products that are now becoming really popular among skins. The Puff Bar, the Mango Mojo, Stig, Posh, Fog. How much, so, so this uh, Stig here, mm -hmm. that's a... You get three of them, it says. Yeah, you're going to ask how much they cost. How much does that cost? I'm not sure. These are all, like, these are just so new. We're, like, chasing our tails to try to keep up with as we Ooh, pass laws. Insane. $16. But these also, heat, these also heat up a liquid inside, but it's just one cigarette's worth or something similar to that. So you can take a couple of puffs, and then in the afternoon you can take a couple of more puffs out of that, and okay. I guess it would, I mean, it depends, I guess, on your draw. Right. How, how much, how quickly right. you go through it. Um, and then the next page just shows you the packaging of these. These are the e-liquids that you can refill the devices with. Fruit pop, pebbles, donuts, I heart popcorn, dripping vape. Ice cream cake. Okay. And then just my last slide is um, we ask you not to erase the progress that has been made. Cigarette use is the only area in Vermont that in terms of improvement that we see. We cannot leave any flavors on the market, including menthol cigarettes. Um, we believe we should place blame where it belongs on the industry selling addiction. Uh, the evidence shows that we, well, we already talked, the, the committee addressed this. We don't want users penalized. Um, it's an addiction. The tobacco industry has marketed to kids, has made it cool amongst kids, and now they're addicted at, at high rates, and we don't believe that trying to come off that addiction, assessing fines, is appropriate or effective. But it sounds like the Senate Health and Welfare Committee removed the, the penalty for kids. Um. So, question I have, and um, go back a long time, because full disclosure, many years ago I represented the cancer, lung, and heart on these issues. We were dealing mostly with second hand smoke at that point, but um, and youth, youth use of tobacco. But there was a uh, a man that some of you may have known. His name is Bruce Cunningham. Yes. He was a gadfly kind of person who really came down hard on the state in terms of them doing compliance testing, sales to minors, et cetera, et cetera. You use the term chasing our tail. I, I'm starting to get the feeling no matter what we do, there will be a new way or a product for the tobacco industry to hook kids. And I'm wondering what your organization feels or has done to promote compliance to you know go after the people who are selling the products to kids <coughs> illegally or that process that he kept harping upon and you know it's one of those things he was a lone voice in the wilderness but he did have a ton of statistics that showed that the state was doing very little in terms of enforcement. Well, I think one thing we can do to not chase our tails is take away why kids want this. And kids want it because they're these fun flavors. If these things didn't taste good, if you remove the cool factor, then there's, they're just not going to be using it at the same degree. If your option is to vape tobacco flavor or a cigarette, which you can't do. Like, kids are vaping in class because they can get rid of it, get away with it, where the teacher's back is turned around the bus. Can't really do that with a cigarette. I think we'll see a huge drop in kids using tobacco if we, and, and there won't, and I mean, I'm sure Big Tobacco is inventive and they'll always try to come up with the next product, but I think 80% of kids 
who use tobacco use a flavored product, if you don't have the flavors, maybe we won't need to chase our tails because there'll be less kids using it. There'll be something else. So we have three kids. What's the biggest thing that we could do to prevent uh, addiction on jewel and tobacco? I think what you could do to prevent addiction would be to take away the flavors because like some flavors might bring back some nostalgia from when they were a child. Like if they just are big in tobacco, then they're not going to really like it. If, what else? If it's good, it's more of a drive to go for it. Like mango, it's sweet, it's tasty, it's fruit. People are going to want it. If the flavors are gone, and they try and just fake tobacco. Tobacco is nasty. People won't like it. Nice. Anything else? Oh, I know some of my friends really like the mint ones. I don't know. Just taking away all the flavors. I think the best. And our fear, too, is what is mint and what is menthol? That we'll just see the tobacco rebranding all of their mint flavors as menthol because menthol is allowed to stay on the market. Well, um, this committee is charged with overseeing uh, tobacco regulation, and, and uh, I'd like to, at some point, as we go through this, to get into the compliance yeah. section. I think we should hear from Patrick. Yeah. Where's that if you want? They're speaking of mint. Senate Health and Welfare brought someone from DLC in, and he, he talked about compliance rates. I have a couple of other handouts. I don't need to talk anymore. Okay. But, uh, and there's one for but this as well. The commissioner of liquor and lottery would be the compliance person, right? And, and would Department of Health also be? I mean, it's mostly Patrick's charge with compliance. Right? Compliance, yeah. Okay, so. Um, is there one for your Is there is anybody here oh, from. You have that one? Okay. From Andy's uh, MMR? I just saw Andy. Andy just just had had side oh. yeah. Andy this just saw Andy's MMR. This is just if you want specific guidance on where the American Cancer Society stands for the FDA regulation. Where. Uh, Ready for you if you're ready for us. Oh, jeez. Sure. <laughs> ready for him, too. Oh, God. Thank you Brandon, very much for your time. Have you been able to locate? Is he ready to testify? When, uh, when Andy's done? When Denise calls, I'll okay. pick up the phone. Okay. Excuse me, I didn't. I just, I just created those. I can give those to you. Email those to you right now. Great. All that stuff is great. Well, well, Discussion here: We manufacture and sell an electronic cigarette called Views, and on the uh, men, on the menthol cigarette side is uh, Newports. Um, I, my issue uh, last year. Well, let me back up. Last year on S86, we came in here and supported the raise of the smoking age to 21. Um, I, I don't. I don't know if H47 came to this committee about raising the tax on uh, vaping products or not. But uh, we, finance. we, we finance. Finance. In fi it was in finance. And our position on that was we were, we were agreeable to raise the tax, but not all the way up to the 92% because of thought there should be some distinction between uh, combustible tobacco and vaping. With regard to um, S-288, uh, my concern is that this primarily, this, this bill impacts adults. This, uh, the FDA, uh, as you see there, 
has banned flavored vaping products, and they specifically targeted those products that are designed primarily uh, looked after kids. Uh, the, the cartridges, if you look at on that the, the piece I sent you, they, um, as they work to, uh, it's a one, two, three, third paragraph on the first page, as we work to combat the troubling epidemic of youth cigarette use, the enforcement policy we're issuing today confirms our commitment to drag, drag, dramatically limit children's access to flavored cigarette products that we know are appealing to them, so-called cartridge-based products that are both easy to use and easily, conceal, uh, easily concealable. And if you look at also in the packet, the uh, 2019 uh, risk, youth risk survey looked about, you know, what type of uh, in, uh, vapor product used by high school students, fuel, rechar you know, rechargeable pods, 80%. So when we had the discussion last year with AS86, it was uh, Juul, Juul, Juul. It was everything about Juul, and it was the fact you get these things out, and it was a dramatic spike. And, um, and so let's raise, and the advocates all indicated that let's raise the age to 21, um, because that's the most important thing that you can do to get this out of the hands of kids. That bill went into effect in September of 2019, September 1, 2019. None of the statistics that are given to you about rise, raise, you know, the, the, the impacts of, of uh, tobacco, people using tobacco, how this works, these were, that was all calculated before this bill went into effect. It's only been in effect for four months. And I would argue that if that was the most important thing that you do, look at that, see how it, see how it, how it works. The FDA, on top of that, um, you know, now has indicated a process where the products that were indicated as being the problem, flavored jewel and other concealable products that are easy, discreet, et cetera, those are gone. It's done. And so um, so what I, my, my issue now is what's left is adults. The other thing I would say is last year when uh, H47 was discussed, I believe it was the Cancer Society indicated, made a calculation that said for every 10% rise in the price of the product, usage decreases 6.5%. You know, that bill, that, that also, that tax went into effect on vapor products in July. Um, so 100% increase, right, you increase, you doubled the price. 100% increase means, according to those statistics, a 65% reduction in the usage. Okay, so I think, Last year, you made two powerful statements with regard to youth usage of uh, tobacco. So right now, what we're left with is adults. And I would make an argument that banning menthol cigarettes, we've looked at bans, and bans don't work. <clears throat> bans just don't work. And I can give you three, which I think are pretty good examples of it. The first is marijuana or cannabis, all right? Despite the fact that um, in the youth, during the, the, the youth risk survey, 27% of 2019 from, uh, Vermont Youth Risk Survey, 27% of high school students tried flavored tobacco product, 40% of high school students tried marijuana, 55% of high school students have tried alcohol. You know, so we're not looking to ban marijuana. In fact, we're looking to unban marijuana, right? We're looking to legalize marijuana for public health and safety reasons because you'll be bringing the product into the commercial, into the area of commerce, and for tax reasons so that you're you know, recognizing, you know, financial benefit for, for it. Um, my anecdotal experience is that during the ban, 40, 50 percent of adults smoke marijuana. I mean, a lot. So that ban didn't. That ban did not work. Uh, I'm talking to people, my colleagues, right? So a lot. Okay. That ban didn't work. Prohibition didn't work. 100 years ago, the 100 year anniversary of prohibition is January. It was January. Didn't work. Um, you, you know, it, it led to a rise in organized crime. It, it, you know, financially fueled the mafia, et cetera. And now today, you look at, in New York City, I saw a stat the other day, I'm gonna try to get it, get it verified, but 87% of the cigarettes sold in New York City 
are illicit. They do not have a state stamp, 87%. I saw an article yesterday in the, in the New York Post that talked about 60% of the bodegas in New York City sell on, you know, on non-state tax stamped cigarettes. Um, adults are going to smoke menthol. You know, Franklin County, you can go to Aquasasne, not very far. Chitney County, you can go to, go to New York and buy them. Rowan County, same thing. Windsor, Wyndham counties, you can go to you know, New York. I mean, New Hampshire is not very far. Adults will smoke. It's just how they get it, where they get it, the, possibly the quality of the product that they get um, as well. So I guess I, I'd be glad to answer questions. I, I, I'd leave two different I'd leave two thoughts in your mind for adults now. If this bill 288 passes, you're going to be able to smoke a joint but not be able to smoke a Newport. And, you know, as an adult, uh, uh, kids, I, I, we, we agree. You know, I think you've done a lot with, with kids. And then the other thing is that um, Massachusetts passed a, a, uh, a vaping bill in the height of the vaping, ep the vaping ep epidemic. And that vaping epidemic has been caught, it has been basically found by the CDC and the FDA now to be caused by vaping vitamin E acetate, principally from illicit products, principally cannabis, marijuana, and so and, and other nicotine issues. And wouldn't it be ironic that your response to this, to, you know, this 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 epidemic or this illness outbreak would be to enact a ban which would therefore force adults to find these products in illicit areas, you know, that would cause the same health products or same health problems that that uh, that started the problem to begin with. I just think that's not a great reaction. I also heard a couple other things I just want to comment about. Um, I, I heard a couple things mentioned that were related to me that were mentioned today. New Jersey passed a flavor ban, but that flavor ban did not include menthol. New York is looking at it. New York is pulling back from a menthol ban. I understand Maine had a discussion about this topic the other day and pulled back from pulled back from the menthol. Uh, I, those aren't, you know, that's 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 the information that I've got. So um, again, I think that with regard to kids and uh, I think age 21 has. Uh, I think, I think has the potential to change that. You don't see a lot of high school seniors who are 21. And, uh, and that was said by the advocates last year is the most important thing you can do to deal with this issue. You've dealt with that issue. It's the, the, the regime has been in effect for four months. And now what you're doing in response is you're telling adults what they can and can't do. We've seen it, we've seen it over and over again. Adults will be able to get the product. They'll be able, you know, how they get it, where they get it, how it works. And I think from an economic, from the economic activity or economic development uh, aspect of, of your role here, you know, the people that are going to be here with this are going to be the, the stores that sell and that sort of thing. I just, I just think that the, this isn't necessary. I think do, doing the parts SC8 that strengthen the uh, protections against youth, fine. I just think that the other aspects of it relative to adults, I don't think you need to do. So, um, I guess my overarching question for you is, it seems like this is all about netball. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, 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 I might not say, I might say, not say 100%, but yeah, you're right, absolutely. I mean, these new design products with all the flavors that are in we're, I, I, we're, loopholes from the federal law that talk about not, not, individual no, things. Correct. It, it, Those are, that's not our concern. Okay. We don't sell them. Your concern is adults, isn't it? Our concern is adults. When views... So you're, you're, you're not concerned that those kind of vaping products, um, as long as menthol cigarettes continue, given the small percentage here that get their yeah. products my, from we the, don't, from we the, don't, from my the like refillable it. thing or from the... We don't, we, don't, we don't sell them and that, we don't have... Yeah, no, we're, that is not our concern. I, I, I'll, I just say that when Views was the leading seller of vaping products not that long ago, three years ago or so, the youth issue was nowhere near as pronounced as it was 
is when when Jewel got into the game, uh, and th that issue is you know, and, and, and so we think that um, I just I just uh, Reynolds position Reynolds sells products to adults. Reynolds sells menthol vaping products to adults that are trying to transition from cigarettes into that into that marketplace. But our primary concern is menthol cigarettes. Absolutely. Uh, any other questions? We have one more witness by phone. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. Welcome. Yes. Oh, sorry. Thank you for this. Oh, no, no. We will try to call Ken Elliott. Hi, Mr. Elliott. This is Denise Gumper. I'm the committee assistant for the Senate Committee on Economic Development. And yeah. we're calling you uh, per Brendan Cosgrove, and um, you're on the record. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. This is uh, Michael Sirocco, chair of the committee. Welcome. Uh, Brendan, you want to introduce him, or you want to just let him? Uh, yeah, Ken Elliott is the uh, Director of Government Affairs for uh, the Vapor Technology Association. Ken, you can correct the uh, title there, but um, uh, Ken is a, an expert on this issue, and I'm going to let him take over from here, Mr. Chen. Okay, we have about 15 minutes or thereabouts, uh, so why don't you get started? Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. As Brendan said, my name is Ken Elliott. I represent the Vapor Technology Association, and we're the association of uh, retail shop owners, um, manufacturers of e-liquids, importers, distributors, wholesalers. We are not um, we are not big tobacco. We don't have big tobacco companies that are members, and we don't have the biggest player in this industry, uh, the electronic cigarette industry. Jewel is a member, so we're more of mom and pop and small to mid-sized businesses. Um, I want to start by talking about the safety of e-cigarettes and share that we know that they're 95% tradition, safer than traditional combustible cigarettes. We know this from the United Kingdom's Royal College of Physicians who's conducted a thorough analysis of the data available to make this determination. And in fact, in the United Kingdom, the 3.6 million vapors, 54% have fully given up smoking. And in October of 2019, they reaffirmed their position, one that they stated a number of times over the last few years, saying that the risk associated with long-term vaping are unlikely to exceed 5% of the harm from smoking tobacco. I also know that there's been some concern about the illnesses associated with some vaping products from last summer and fall. Hello? Number, there are a number of health entities that accurately reported the cause linked to vitamin E acetate oil, which had been used in illegal THC cartridges as a cutting agent to be used in an electronic cigarette, a product that was never designed to be used for those, those sort of liquids. These entities included the New York Department of Health and the New England Journal of Medicine. And in early January of just this year, the CDC made a definitive statement on the safety of ENDS products or electronic nicotine delivery systems and the illnesses linked to vitamin E acetate oil. Now, the BPA is con committed to preventing youth access to e-cigarettes, and we favor meaningful reforms designed to target access to these products. As a result, it's an important thing to do to examine the real issues around youth usage. The most recent National Youth Tobacco Survey conducted by the CDC provides some insight into youth behaviors. In that 2019 survey, 22.4% of those surveys said that flavors were the reason they tried the product. In other words, 80% of the respondents said that something other than flavors led them to trying e-cigarettes. 
And these, range, these reasons range from curiosity to peer pressure. And in addition to that, we know that the FDA has determined that 86% of youth usage is driven through social sources, meaning that a friend or a relative provides access to the, the device that they try. But we don't have to rely on national data. In fact, Vermont has some data of their own that in a survey done by the Public Health Department that they do every two years, and they just publish their own youth, youth risk survey. <coughs> The data in this reveals some interesting insights. 10% of the respondents who tried an e-cigarette in, in Vermont in the last 30 days, that was 26% of the total subjects, 10% of those who tried an e-cigarette said that they did so due to the availability of flavored products. That means 90% of the kids who tried an electronic cigarette in Vermont did so for some other reason. And that can be found on page 59 of that report. In addition, we know that 6% of those under age who tried the product, and it was 18 at the time, the, the purchase age was 18 at the time of the survey, 6% of those bought the product in a re retail location, and 3% bought it online. So a full 91% of youth who tried the product received it through some other source. And finally, 8% of respondents stated that they use an open system, meaning that 92% that use some other type of product, a closed system de device, primarily, leaving 8% the, 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 to try the open system, which are primarily used by adults. And, and I know that there's been some new concern about disposable products, but that survey also shows that only 2% of the 26% per kids who try to a flavored product did so using a disposable product. So this legislation is targeting really the products that are used by adults. And I'll take it one step further. Last year, Juul pulled all their flavored products from the market, and that's the product that's the, the most popular product in the, in the marketplace. And on February 6th, the FDA banned all pod, banned all pod-based flavored products from the market. That's the date that they went into effect, leaving only flavored products for open systems primarily. So I'd like to suggest that there's really no need for a flavor ban in Vermont. The state's youth risk behavior survey makes it clear that youth are not motivated to use the product by flavors. They access it through friends and family, and they use pod-based systems where the flavors are already banned. In addition, just recently testimony given to the Senate Health and Welfare Committee by the Vermont Department of Liquor Control Chief revealed that in a five month period since the legal age to purchase nicotine products was raised to 21, clients rates have risen from 90% to 95%. He stated that that was, he's never seen a single rise of 5%, that it's the largest he had ever seen was 2%. The unintended consequence of the, of the proposed legislation would target adults who are seeking an alternative to possible cigarettes and really just push them back to the more harmful product. So I'm, 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 I'm saying we don't need the flavor ban, but if you want to act for forms that are really designed at targeting this issue, there are other things that can be done. We can implement strict marketing standards designed to prevent nicotine products from being marketed or attracted to youth. That would be banning print advertising to adult-only publications, ban advertising and sponsorships in, in big outdoor venues. Uh, we can prevent the use of terms like candy, candies, variants, and those sorts of things. We can prevent the use of terms like cake or cake variants. We can remove all cartoons and all kid-friendly packaging from these products. And, and that is something that, that should be done. In addition, we would recommend point of sale age verification so that an ID is checked and the validity of the ID is checked in a, in a retail location. There should be warning signs in brick and mortar stores. We should end bulk, bulk sales to an individual who's not licensed to sell these products. And we should end the practice of allowing somebody to go in and buy a bunch and then turn around and sell it. There should be stiff fines in place if you're caught selling a product without a tobacco license. So I'll pause there. I know I've thrown a lot at me and take any questions that members of the committee might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So for adults, uh, are you suggesting that there's a great need to keep all these flavors available to them, or you focus mostly on mint and menthol? I, I, 
Over 90% of adults who use an electronic cigarette as an alternative to, to a traditional cigarette use some flavored product other than tobacco or menthol. So what we're saying is keep flip responsible flavors available for all adults. And the adults overwhelmingly use these open system products. I should I hate to single one out, but but Brendan Cosgrove sitting there in the room, he's an adult that uses an electronic cigarette product and he uses a flavored product other than tobacco or mint menthol. Other than tobacco or menthol. So there are flavored products that don't have tobacco or nicotine in them, or they all have nicotine? There, there are both. There are flavored products for open systems that contain nicotine that are some other flavor than tobacco or menthol, and there are flavored products other than tobacco and menthol that contain no nicotine. In fact, there are open system users that want, who want to wean off nicotine will start with a 3% nicotine content wean down to 1%, and then because smoking is such a habitual thing, they will vape zero nicotine content flavored products just because of the habit of the hand-to-mouth um, piece of smoking. When you say open system, can you describe that to, to me? Yes, sir. So, so there, there are two systems, that, two types of systems that dominate the market. There's the closed system, which you know of as a jewel, where there is a device with a pod that's manufactured by that company, and only that pod is to be used with that device, and the pods are not designed to be refilled in any way. Once the pod is empty, it's disposed of. Then there are the bigger devices that you've seen. Sometimes they're called mods. There's the bigger open systems that have a tank on them in which you go buy the liquid of your choice and put it in that device and base it. So those are the two predominant systems out there. There is a small, very small market of disposable products that are more similar to the pod-based products. But the, the, the two kinds of products that dominate the market are closed systems like a jewel and then the open systems. And the open systems are what I was referring to earlier, the overwhelming, majority of use of those products is by adults. Like in the Vermont survey, it's 92% of kids use a closed system, not an open system. And that's what you surmise is the reason why the federal government banned flavors but only applied those to closed systems? Because they want them? Yes, sir. That was, that was exactly the reason. It was to leave flavors available for adults, the systems that adults use. Any other questions? <clears throat> Adults are great money. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to do this by phone. I really do. Thank you very much. Okay. Do you have a copy of your testimony that you can get to us? Yes, sir. I'll send it to Brendan who can provide it to you. Yeah, it would be great if it could be emailed to us. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Yes, I'll send it to Brendan so he can send it over to you. Great. Thanks, Thank Ken. You. Thank, thank yeah. you. Yep. Yeah, bye bye. Okay. Uh, so we uh, will be in connect, contact with the Health and Welfare Committee to see where they're going with this and whether or not we need to formally take this bill into our committee. Uh, and if we do, there'll be more testimony. But we're done a little early, which is good. And I have a meeting in about five minutes, I think. So thank Good. you very much. Yes. If we want to do compliance, we have passion.